Hello from Collector's Maze. This is Jeremy Webster, and I'm here today with Paul Niemeyer, artist extraordinaire, designer. Uh, some of the, for, for my generation particularly, some of the uh, iconic video game cabinets at the time. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Ooh, we had a little bit of latency there. You were talking and your lips weren't moving. That's a magic effect. Uh-oh. <laughs> You're just a secondary thing. The internet and all of its wonders. And... Um, you're gonna you fickle mistress you <laughs> oh isn't that right yeah zoom is such a zoom is um the the gift that keeps on hurting <laughs> to put it that way so um you're gonna uh you're gonna come down for the uh for the uh con we got going in october and yes the uh designer of the iconic mortal combat i always think of it as a medallion um, um yeah let, hold on let's let, let's uh back the truck up i i didn't design it oh and, and yeah this this is uh i illustrated it oh uh, yeah see this this is a point of contention uh -huh. and ha and has led to many a heated little argument uh, including uh, uh ed, ed boone uh, and i clashing on social media over it to where mm -hmm. I had to say, I never said I designed it. I always say I illustrated such a, you know, such a poignant little thing. But you oh, know, I got you. I didn't design it. No, so actually, it, it's a it's an old kung fu fighting symbol mm -hmm. that, that John Tobias uh, nabbed and, and and incorporated. And then, uh, um, I mean, he he gave me. I got I got roughs. And then I went and cleaned them all up and, and made the, the final artwork. You know, it's kind of like somebody else wrote the song and then I played it. And oh, I got okay. so, Yeah, so that, that's kind of what you're hearing. You know, it's just that, you know, nobody knew who, who actually played the song <laughs> for 27 years. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's that. <laughs> it's not like the Nashville music scene, yeah. Or... Where it's no <laughs> the, the other way around or, may, or maybe it is maybe it's a little bit more like it than we want to think it is <laughs> you know, so, like who who played that awesome lead who knows but it's it's kick-ass and boy that song wouldn't be the same without it would it nope. right <laughs> the 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 ongoing legend of the um the kiss albums where members weren't actually on the albums and they had other people playing the parts and then no nah, but we'll put their name in the credits anyway they only left right. the band six months before we started <laughs> well okay that you brought up kiss oh my god that, that, that's um that they try to cut out uh the drummer uh the, their their biggest hit beth yeah which was which was a ballad right you know right. so yeah. so and he's such an, an antithesis of what the the band was about their biggest hit was a ballad was by a the ballad. drummer by the drummer who who you know so they okay did you ever hear that they, they re-recorded it with with somebody new so they could just cut him the hell out is that that's just sad it's just that is really oh and, god and he yeah. wrote that song didn't he Barbara? yeah that was oh like, yeah they 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 double effed him uh, oh, oh god dude. yeah yeah and i don't want to mention any names but the bass player was behind that <laughs> <laughs> no way we'd never do something like that ever. no no <laughs> iconic heroes don't meet your heroes <laughs> yeah sometimes your yeah. heroes aren't exactly as pretty as you'd think they'd be yeah oh god that's another thing oh my god that's so funny anybody who's been to a comic-con can tell you <laughs> right <laughs> i'm going to meet my star oh my god he was in Battlestar galactica oh yeah that was a long time ago pal <laughs> that picture you saw okay get yeah brace for impact <laughs> <laughs> wait till you see this guy now Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that's the magic and, okay that, i should have said battlestar galactica that, that that was just that just popped into my head i have no you know dark <laughs> Bennett probably looks awesome <laughs> probably i don't know <laughs> It's a lot of stuff. I think. I'm not sure. But <laughs> I'm just I'm getting myself in deeper. I, I'm like you way you know way too much about Battlestar Galactica <laughs> <laughs> to, to have made that random. And it was. I swear with God as my witness. <laughs> it's random. Nobody's buying it. No, nobody. 
So you got your start in um in Valley pinball machines? Oh, I, I at the time I wish that that was my big dream was mm -hmm. um was to uh, uh, do artwork on pinball machines. Uh, I I used to skip class in college. I, I had a couple other guys. We you know we we go to the graphic arts class. Make sure we were counted. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, sneak out and go play pinball at the union. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you know. So my big thing was, oh yeah, well, I want to be a pinball artist. I would, you know. So um, how, okay, how, how I got uh, started at Bally, I'll, I'll tell that story. I, I was working at a little little sign company. I was about two years out of out of school. I was working at a little sign company on the southwest side of Chicago, and, um, and a buddy called me up that day and he, he said, man, I saw an ad. It described you perfectly. It's for Bally Midway. I'm like, what? The, the pinball place? Holy Jesus. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm hang, hung up the phone. I'm going, okay, lunchtime. So no morning. Phone rings again. It's another friend who didn't know the first friend also telling me about the ad that he saw that was describing me perfectly for Bally Midway. Bally Midway. I'm like, the universe is speaking to me, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, okay, so lunchtime, I called him up and I got an interview. And uh, you know, it was like three interviews before I got the job. And uh, I was technically hired by Midway, and I found myself working on video games. And I remember at the time thinking, "Oh, son of a bitch!" <laughs> right. I wanted, I wanted so bad to work on on pinball. I could taste it, you know. And they put me on these damn video games. This will never amount to anything. <laughs> right mm. oh, yeah. <laughs> okay yeah, yeah. listen this, this is the farm boy in me going on i had something set in my head and i'm gonna stick to that for the rest of my life <laughs> right wrong <laughs> again <laughs> a lot of left turns to you know I got here you know, eventually. You make enough left turns, you get back to where you go. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, no, the three three left turns equals a right if you if you if you're very persistent about it. <laughs> Just keep turning the left. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> How many oh, arcade man. machines did you end up doing um doing work for? Work on? Do you have any idea? Okay, well, um, yeah, so I started work. Well, I started for uh, uh midway. And um, so a couple months after I started, they, they had a grand plan in place. And the plan was to bring uh, the Bally uh, pinball gods and all of their, their stuff uh, and join the two art departments together and make one big Bally Midway art department where we're going to be doing pinball and video games and, and, and everything. And it was the most amazing place to work in all my history in the business and and after in 84 i went freelance and i've been freelance ever since so yeah that's what almost 40 years good jesus oh my god 38 years ago yeah how sad is that uh 38 years ago i went freelance you know mm -hmm. so you think even if you worked in four different places every year you know, it's like 150 different places <laughs> that's a lot of places that's and i can I, yeah i can honestly look back at it and i'll go and say that that job at valley midway from 1982 to 84 was the best job i ever 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 had and it was the most amazing experience i ever had i probably learned more in those two years hanging out uh in the art department with the with the pinball art odds that they brought over, you know, that we was changing ideas with. In those two years, that's where my real education came from. Mm -hmm. Man, that was just an amazing. And Paul Ferris was was our boss. He was the boss boss, and then under him was Greg Ferris. Uh, the, the names names are pronounced the same, spelled completely different. You know, no relation whatsoever. <laughs> was a little confusing, but you know, whatever. Um, yeah, so they brought all those guys over after I'd worked there a couple of months. And and Valley had just, uh, uh, Midway had just bought, uh, built this huge uh, office building, four story, you know, black glass, um, and then attach it to the factory. And, and it was huge. And I mean, um, it was all being built when they first hired me. 
So you can see they were, they were building a whole new idea. They're building an art department. They're building the building around <laughs> the art department. <laughs> you know, everything was brand new. And, and um, we, we kind of nicknamed the building. And, you know, it's funny how this worked out. We nicknamed the building the house that Pac built. You know, <laughs> Pac man was so huge, right? Well, as you remember in the house that Jack built, the house came down. Hmm. That kind of, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, nobody thought of that when we were saying it, but you know, so anyway, the house, the pack built, um, pack so they, they, they moved us all, yeah, they moved us all in together, and, and here I, here I am, I'm, I'm like one cubicle away from Margaret Hudson, and, and, you know, Doug Watson, and Tony Ramone, and Greg Ferris is my boss, and, uh, uh you know, uh, a Pat McMahon, and uh, oh my God. You know, and my boss's boss is Paul Ferris, pinball god. I'm I'm fanboying at work, <laughs> you know, right? right? Yeah. I spent my yeah, I spent my college career playing all these dudes' games, and now here I am actually working with them. Yeah, that has I'm, to be surreal. Geek, yeah, I was geeking out. I was totally geeking out. <clears throat> you know, and I'm I'm a little farm boy. I, you know, I, was, I, I grew up on a dairy farm out in the middle of freaking nowhere. You know, there was hardly any art art programs or anything. My, my parents had to drive like 30 miles to take me to an art class. Uh, but, uh -huh. but, they, they, but you know what? They, they saw the potential in me and supported it and, and always made sure that I had time to draw uh, despite my, my farm, uh, you know, chores and whatever. Because, you know, dairy farm, shit. You know, a real working dairy farm. <laughs> you know, now, you know, I love I love people who go, oh, I, I grew up on a farm. No, you visited your cousin's farm yeah. once in the summer and you threw one fucking bale. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, I got to drive the tractor around the yard. Shut up! Yeah. Oh. No. Um. But yeah, out here in uh, Kansas, yeah. we have I grew up on a real farm, busting my ass. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 well yeah you know it, it's 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 usually the city bar that i'm telling this story and there's somebody that's when that comes out <laughs> it's oh, never God. in kansas <laughs> <laughs> oh. so um well go ahead go ahead i was just gonna ask were, were you working there during the uh the video game crash years yes Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. Um, now, boy, I'll I'll tell you what a, what a weird experience for the whole the whole situation went from here zero to zero overnight. Just just hit the skids like suddenly everybody's losing their jobs. And, and the worst part of it was we were attached to the factory. Mm -hmm. uh, one hallway away, the, the double doors that, that led out of the art department, there was a hallway and there were double doors across it, went right into the factory. You couldn't have gotten any closer. You know, so if we wanted to see how the artwork was printing uh, on the line, it was 30 steps away. It, that was pretty crazy. But because of that closeness, it also, you know, it made us real close to the people who work in the line. You know, yeah. we knew all the supervisors by name. Hell, we'd go out with a beer and have a beer with them, you know, and now they're losing their jobs, you know. Uh, and and you know it would be Black Friday every um, Friday was Black Friday and you know oh, oh, another thirty got let go from the factory again oh shit you know Bob they let go Bob I can't believe it you know so long before we were cut that shit was happening that pretty much you know threw a turd in a punch bowl you know for 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 any future anything going on. So I've got a little bit of a story uh, about uh, the the end the end. <laughs> the end. Um, so so um, yeah, that's funny. We're going from the beginning to the end. Let's skip in the middle. Um, yeah. Ah, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so at, at the end, um, I, I was I, I found myself working on a game called Midnight Marauders, uh -huh. and. And I don't know if you, if you just saw, just recently I posted on my, my uh, Facebook page, um, Doc Mack uh, here in, in Brookfield, here in Chicago, uh, 
uh, he has the largest, uh, you know, arcade in the world, um, Galloping Ghost Arcade. Mm-hmm. Uh, about oh, maybe two or three years ago now, uh, I was on a podcast of his, and I brought some of that that uh, just wayward artwork. You know, I didn't, I I knew so little about it. I did not even know that the game had actually been made. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, okay. So here's my situation at 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 Bally. Um, I'm working on this game and it's pretty much all my artwork. Everything on it is almost all my artwork, not quite, but almost, you know. Uh, <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to shine on this game and I'm going to show them that they cannot live without Paul E. Niemeyer on board here. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so that was my big grand plan, okay? So that was my mentality working on that game. Uh, I'm just gonna throw myself. In. Oh, I was working extra. I, I even remember. Uh, I I made the vacuum form uh, sculpture. You know, for the there, there's like a, a a lunar surface in it. It's a shooting game. I, I, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. It's a shooting game. Like they wanted an old arcade style shooting game, and you shot a laser at at, at these targets, mm-hmm. and uh, it actually had vacuum form. You know, so I want to sh- show off, you know, I, I've actually got a ceramics degree. <laughs> so I don't, I'm going to use that damn thing. You know? <laughs> so, right. So believe it or not, I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, I, I have another life where I'm actually an acclaimed uh, ceramic sculptor and has a fine art thing going on. But anyway, that's, that's something else too. Anyway, um, I, 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 I'm trying to shine just as much as possible to show them, you know, because we all knew the axe was hanging over us and, and i was low man on the totem pole i only had two years in and you know the pinball art gods had seven eight years you know they've been around longer than me whatever whatever the situation was everybody was there longer than me so i, I figured i better better do something to you know make myself stand out so i'm busting my ass on, on midnight marauders and five minutes after was done they were like thank you and there's the door <laughs> you know? and i thought oh son of a bitch you know okay now fast forward a couple of years okay i run yeah. into paul ferris at a wedding okay <laughs> and somehow no yeah 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 and so, so somehow the, the whole the whole big crash thing comes up and we're laughing about it and i i said yeah i was really hoping i was gonna you know, shine on, on that last game and that they would, you know, keep me around and, you know, and he goes, that's not what happened. That's not what it was at all. He said, I, I, I begged them to keep you on until you could finish the artwork on the game. They were going to can your ass before that. And I, and I, I bought you time on that game to finish it. I was like, really? <laughs> what the? Did not know that. Yeah. So, you know, so here, here, this this brings up a bigger bigger issue. Um, I was just talking to Warren Davis uh, in uh, uh, Free Pay, Florida, and uh, oh, oh, I remember we were, we were introduced. That's what it was. Uh, we were doing a a panel on on Midway people, you know, mm-hmm. and and uh, so they they had him and myself, and I forget who else was there, but you know, and. Uh, um, they were treating us like we we're like this is the long lost reunion. Oh my gosh, you guys, you know. And and they said, well, how long have you worn known each other? I said, well, we're, we introduced ourselves on the way over to down the hallway here, walking into the in, into this meeting room. <laughs> right. Never met. You know, they they didn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, Brian Brian Colin. Okay, there's that that that's it. Yeah, Brian Cullen and I, we worked on a lot of games together, but you'd never know it while working there. Then, you know, I rarely saw him. We, we knew of him more than anything. And he was only on the second floor, but you know what? You had to have a special code for the, to use in the elevator to go anywhere in that elevator. So if you didn't have a reason to go up to the second floor, you weren't going. You weren't just visiting. You no. Know? Uh, and the third floor was we we nicknamed it Black Ops because I think I was there maybe once and that was by accident, you know. <laughs> and, and it's even weird. I remember the door opened up and it, and it's like it's all dark and there's just lights and big big computer and you see somebody down sitting and you know and they turn around and look like like that the door never opens here. 
who could have been <laughs> like trade security sort of who thing? knows i have no idea what's going on, on the third floor but like like i said we just you know black ops man i know that i remember watching some documentaries going back the floor was the ivory tower you know, with the boys upstairs and v, vps and their secretaries and they had accounting department and the sales department you know they're all up there they all had all window seats <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I remember watching some documentaries. Let's face it, you know, where's the money coming from? Not from those schmucks downstairs. <laughs> they're, they're just making the machines that, right, right. Yeah, but, yeah those putzes, you know, they'll work for peanuts. And as, as it turns out, we were working for peanuts. And I, I found that out, uh, ironically, by going freelance. When I went back to work for them for freelance, I made literally double what I was making. That well, I was an employee. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, believe it. <laughs> that's the whole business. That's every business. That's not just the yeah, that's... video game business, you know. That's true. But, uh, yeah, a lot of weird things. The security was just crazy there. Uh, it was like working at Fort Knox, you know, or, or the Pentagon or, or, or something, you know, really. Okay. In 1982, I had a card with a magnetic strip on it. I didn't see credit cards with the magnetic strips on it for probably an, another, I don't know, we've lived a couple of years. Right. You know, that was back in the day when, when they still had the thing, you know, the little thing that would, uh, you know, you'd go over and take the impression of the card. And I, okay. Yeah. You know, that's what all credit cards were at the time in 1982. I have a pass card with, a, with this strange brown thing on the back that I later, later was told was a magnetic strip. That was, how about it? 1982. 1982. And, then, and then, yeah, and then, and then every every month the, the passcode changed. Incredible. You issued your own passcode just to get in the building, just at the front front, you know, just to walk in the, for work in the morning. And there were weird shit that happened. Okay, I was there. Um, three separate occasions, customs agents came to the to. The, uh, the building looking for stuff and once to the art department they had everybody pushed away from our desk to just sit there hands on our folded on our laps for about an hour for whatever reason and i found out later that they were looking for i agree for this this is right out of a spy novel um military information piggybacked on to hard drives from games they had bought overseas and brought it because they were uh, when, when pac-man hit and, and everything got got super popular we were doing games but but there was also kind of this um we always felt a little backstabbed in that they would take huge fistful of money and go to japan and just throw money at, at games right. and they bring back these games you know and then uh, and, and here's how I, I had personal knowledge of it mainly because um I was trying to, uh, I was always trying to carve out a niche for myself in the art department. So one of the things that I carved out was uh, I was like the fastest marker rendering guy on the planet. And I, and I took those skills to, to the uh, um, ad agencies after I got laid off and I made a bundle, just a ton of money off, 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 off of that. But anyway, going back to Bally Midway, um, I made myself that guy. So that meant that any, any test game or any, uh, you know, uh, um, archetype or any kind of game that was that you know they were screwing around with, whether it was developed by some outsider or bought from Japan or, you know, stolen from some other company. <laughs> you should have seen our arcade. That was there was a, yeah there was some weird top secret stuff just in our in the personal arcade in the building that we would go and, you know, when you you'd have the competitions game there before it was released. How the <laughs> I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say what it was, but it happened, and I was just like WTF. Okay, all right. So now you're getting a, you're getting a picture here of securities, high pass codes, customs agents showing up, you know, looking for spy secrets and finding them. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? This is, yeah. So I, I, I was later told that the only industry that hires more spies than the toy and game industry is the actual spying industry. The actual spy industry. Oh, spying's big. Hey, the first week I was there, I don't remember the guy's name. 
Um, but he, he was a designer. And I mean, and you got to know, I mean, it's my first week. I'm just like, oh boy, oh, hello. Oh, you know, right. I'm working a boo, you know. <laughs> anyway, I'm an idiot. You know, I'm just a total noob. You know, just, just, I'm like grazing in the pasture, hoping something's going to happen. And, and, uh, and uh, that first week, came back the uh, the next Monday, and it turns out that some some designer, some big shot, had packed up everything, like downloaded his, like just emptied, emptied everything, downloaded all, everything he could, and showed up on the doorstep of Atari out in California m- Monday morning. And, mm-hmm. and and I, you know, I, I barely knew who the guy was. I, I, but I, I distinctly remember him going, "See you on Monday," guy, you know, like walking out on Friday, you know. And I'm like, "Okay, mm-hmm. bye." I hope I get to work with him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah. So that was that was a weird start. That was a weird start. That, you know, somebody somebody bailed and and uh, you know, uh, emptied the coffers and and took it with them and and uh, and and that's when security got crazy, bumped up. You know, uh, it was nutty. I was kind of right there, like when it all happened, uh, you know, from the very start. And, and, and a lot of it was just an unwitting participant. I had no idea what the hell was going on around me, but, uh, you know, it was hitting the fan in a big way. You could tell just, the, you know, the feel of the place. Right. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, 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 you know, the funny thing, at, at the, let's go back to that, that whole video game um, what are we calling it? Do we, is it has a name the where where you know, like eighty four where or eighty three and eighty four where it all kind of the bottom dropped out of it? Like we, I always heard of it called the video game crash. The, the what? The video game crash. A crash. Oh, that that's a good yeah. one. Cra- yeah, there you go. There you go. Because there's a couple yeah. of do- um, documentaries on like Atari and a couple of the companies, and they always refer to it as the crash of in whatever year usually video game crash or whatever year it seems to yeah. Yeah. term term well <clears throat> well and and i don't know how how like on on point this this is but i'll, I'll tell this tale anyway this is what it was told to me okay mm-hmm. and i'm gonna pre- i'm gonna preface it by saying this is what was told to me that a lot of the problem uh that that kind of caused the crash was a uh, uh <clears throat> Arcade owners were, were bitching about the prices of, of the games. And now, even in 1982, 83, uh, the games were going for $2,000, $2,500, somewhere in that range per game. You know, and they, they weren't leasing the games to the guys. They, they, had to, they had to buy them outright. And then they were stuck with getting rid of them or doing, you know. So the games were popular until they weren't. Until they weren't. No. And then... You know, so now you, you've, you've created a problem in that, you know, they've got a glut of games that, and, and there's a high turnover because now it's the most, you know, it's the hottest, coolest, sweetest, finest thing ever. And, 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 every, and everybody wants, you know, uh, the newest, greatest game. What is, what is it? What is it? What is it? I'll go to the arcade and spend every dime I have, quarter, every quarter I have, you know, uh, on, on that game. Okay. So now that that's the situation. Uh, <clears throat> so the arcade owners are coming to the industry and they're going, help, help us. You know, we, we, we want to be part of it. We want to do this. We can all make money. God knows there's money to be made here, but we're losing it all by having to buy these games. And the games are getting more and more complicated, which equals more and more expensive. And yeah. Yeah, and and the industry's answer to that that statement was Dragon's Lair, which oh. yeah, yeah. Think about that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. They hired Don Blue Studios, and, and it was gorgeous. And I remember going to the video game convention and seeing it, and, and thinking to myself, "We're fucked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh my god, we are so screwed." You know, and because it was like just amazing. Amazing, but we didn't understand the impact that it was going to have on the on the gaming industry because I, I think at the time it was going for like maybe forty five hundred dollars. I mean, you know, because it, it had that huge ass disc reader that was yeah. in it, and and the disc, you know, the discs were like twelve inch. They were like like albums. They were like that record, big yeah. at, at, at the time, you know, uh, in like eighty three. When I, I guess that was yeah, 
yeah. you know. <clears throat> so they're, they're like, really? Really? This is what you, oh, here, spend twice as much on one game as you were before. That's your answer to us? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Nuts. Right. And, and, you know, and turmoil ensued. <laughs> And, and and before you knew it, you know, um, the bottom was dropping out of it. And, you know, and then, you know, the rest, everybody, everybody, it was Black Friday every Friday. And then finally, I, you know, and, and actually it's funny. Um, they did me a huge favor. The timing couldn't have been better. Being the first one out, they let me go. I remember it was on my mom's birthday, March 23rd. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, a- after that, um I had a couple of buddies that are working in the ad agencies and they're going, Hey, we're just starting all the Christmas uh, um, campaigns. Boy, we could really use a hand. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> jingle bells. Jingle bells, indeed. Oh, jingle bells. <laughs> <laughs> just send me a PO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> right. You know, it, and it, it was great. We were gunfighters. You know, we'd ride in, shoot up the. <laughs> <laughs> grab a PO and ride off into the sunset at the end of the day <laughs> oh man that was the life yeah and, and I just built on that and uh, oh man I, I rode that well 30 years I worked in the ad agency I still get work out of the ad agency people that I knew and you know uh, mm-hmm. the funny thing with that is every art director that you worked for if, if they're worth their salt and, and all the ones I did were they all b- got bumped up to creative director and then they became vice presidents. And at that point, they don't hire you anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn it, their success was not m- tied to my success. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so th- evolved, you know, and, and uh, uh, at, at one point, I, I was part owner in a board game company. Mm-hmm. Uh, called Eagle Eagle, Eagle Games, uh, yeah. Eagle. And then the, the um, we sold off the interest to Griffin Games, and now it's Eagle Griffin Games. They're still around. Um, mm-hmm. they, they put together some nice games. I've, I've done a lot of work, uh, artwork for them long after uh, uh, Eagle was absorbed by them. Um, in, f- in fact, a uh, uh, funny thing: uh, Jeffrey Lee, uh, the artist on Cubert, one of one of the creators of Cubert. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Um. A fr- good friend uh, was at a toy fair or something and picked up one of my games from like 15 years ago. That was a it was a Griffin game. Be- I think before they called themselves the Eagle Griffin, uh, they, they had actually absorbed the company at the time. But you know, and I was just working freelance and did this game, and you know, he just happened to find it, and pick- so I just put it on my Facebook page. I thought it was kind of funny. You know, they're still floating around out there, and every once in a while, you know, one pops up and go, "Oh, I remember that." <laughs> so and, yeah it, so it, uh, yeah, anyway yeah then, oh go ahead go ahead i'm sorry uh, it, it it must be kind of an amazing creative outlet to take something like say a board game or something like the the early video game scene where effectively the game you know is its components or whatever little things you see on screen and you sort of have to interpret that in some way that's really exciting or like you know what i mean the the art on the outside you got three pixels that's a guy and on the side of the machine you have sort of an iconic gunslinger or or something like that yeah yeah well you know we got very spoiled back in the old days because you had this big old machine to put graphics on you know, mm-hmm. and, and now when I when I when I'm working, I mean, uh, okay, I, I do a lot of work for um, uh, Premium Edition now, um, uh, doing uh, uh, Nintendo Switch games. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, anyway, one of them what, what I did was uh, um, Pigeon Dev Games. This this is my artwork here. Uh huh. So okay. Anyway, um, but the point being that this is the size of oops sorry this is the size of the format now. Okay. We had whole big, huge games, cabinets, yeah. right? Huge. <laughs> so that was great fun. Um, and after that, it was just like, Oop, they're gone. You know, um, in, in a way, I can see how that kind of led you into, into success in the, in the marketing advertising field, though, because those machines have to be um, illustrated in such a way to draw the eye. You got 500 machines in an arcade. 
what is going to catch that user's eye to make them want to play that game. That, that, that's a very poignant uh, observation, actually. Um, yeah, you know, and a funny thing that, that, that when you say that to me, when I go to shows and, uh, uh, and I always, um, I always tag myself as the Mortal Kombat guy. Mm-hmm. You know, mainly because I, th- I think that's that's the most identifiable, and that's probably that's the game that has the most success out of everything I've ever done. You know, I I don't think I'd be getting the same play if I you know tag myself as the Satan's Hollow guy. <laughs> <laughs> but you got you got the you got the Tron machine to your credits. Well, well, okay, but you know what? I mean, I, I got yeah, yeah, right. You know, so. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Try, here. Here. Here's perfect. Tron. Tron was done in the way that pretty much all games are done now, but back then it was the exception, not the rule. Right. Okay. And and here's what I mean by that. Um, Disney provided all the artwork. There was no question about it. Um, Doug Watson got to actually illustrate the. Um, the Tron guy throwing the disc on the side of, of like, I think the, uh, uh, the environmental cabinet. Yeah. Okay. But that was the only leeway on that artwork that there was. And that was, that was a hundred percent Doug. The rest of it was me cutting the color screens. Okay. Now I'm not going to, that's an art in itself, man. <laughs> Especially when I kind of hadn't done it before. Well, I shouldn't say that. Um, I had cut screens before, uh, but for just small things. Like I think the very first thing I did was was the um, uh, the cocktail cabinet uh, for Ms. Pac Man. Like the, my my, my okay. first day, my first day was a cut. Of, just it was just cutting color. Like the artwork already mm-hmm. existed. It was just you know you're you're just you're a production artist really. I'm <laughs> you know, just a glorified production artist, right? <laughs> okay. But I'm working at Bally Midway. Are you now? So, <laughs> <laughs> right? right yeah. So that was my attitude at the time. And I figured, hopefully, something will come out of this eventually. You know, I'll, I'll be actually actually doing real artwork on, on a game eventually. But so I had to I had to do all the color uh, um, separations for Tron. That, that that was my contribution to it. But that was a that was a shit ton of work. And uh, it was not easy. Because, I mean, you've looked at the artwork on it; just little tiny lines, intricate. Yeah. Numbers. So, so here's the here's the problem. Uh, <clears throat> when you're dealing with uh, silk screens that are that huge, they got they're going to want to shift. Now, maybe only a sixteenth of an inch, but it shifted a sixteenth right. of an inch. All right. So if, if you f up. And you know, make make it too close. You're gonna have that little tiny thread line on the edge of things. You've you've seen that sometimes. A little tiny. How the hell did I get that? Yeah, that's why how that happened. The you know the, the the screen shifted just enough to reveal a tiny little edge or something. So you you try to cut them so they don't have that happen. So you know, but if if it's close quarters, you you don't want to start having it infringing on other graphics. Mm-hmm. You know, you see, you see where I'm going with that. Yeah, yes. So, so that that was the nightmare that was, uh, you know, Tron. That and, and that, that machine was all straight lines and grids, and and it's not like they're subtle straight lines because they replicated the movies. I always think of the light bike things, and they have a line, and it lights up, and so it's not like well, it's a subtle line. Nobody's going to notice it. It that me that oh. machine with just a little shifting could go from this really cool looking grid look to like a disorganized a disaster event. wow right. <laughs> yeah right well okay you know we always we always had a, a saying in the in the business that um you know if you do it totally right no one will notice fuck it up everyone will everyone will notice yeah that's that's and, true and, you know and, if, if it's wrong, oh boy, I was so close, ah, you know. But if it's right, you're like, okay, moving on. <laughs> and yeah, and, and at at the time, with like you look at like um like Atari, where you have three million games and and or whatever, you know, tons and tons of games, and a bunch of them were that were coming out were like considered fairly mediocre. But you throw out a a, a, 
an ET or, or that Pac-Man and everyone's angry. You know? Oh, and that was so what? weird to me because I was little when that Pac-Man came out and I, I think I played that thing forever. Right. <laughs> that Atari Pac-Man because that was the Bless Pac-Man you, you had. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, no, you're right. You're right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, and, and oh, I'm glad you brought up Pac-Man too. That, that, that is a goofy, um, all the stuff that, that Pac-Man went through because I, I did mm-hmm. uh, the artwork for the header for a Super Pac-Man and for Pac-Man Plus. Uh, Pac-Man Plus, they, they came to me and they said, hey, we want the words, you know, exciting, new, uh, and Pac-Man Plus, we want it in the Pac- Pac-Man alphabet. And I said, oh, the one that doesn't exist? It didn't exist. Oh, well, I guess it's on you to do it. And it was. So that's what I did. I, I, I probably I made the very first Pac-Man alphabet, Pac-A-Bet, whatever you want to call it. Whatever happened to it, unknown. But mm-hmm. I was working at Bally Midway, so of course they owned it outright because I was an employee. So whatever happened to it, if it ever got published, I know we use it for that game and we use it for, for some other stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't know if it was actually syndicated and became a, a, a you know, the actual Pac-Man. There's been a number of, of uh, rebirths of the Pac-Man alphabet since then. I'm sure, you know, every, you know, uh, uh, every package, you know, every uh, typeface package has, has Pac-Abed in there or, or some version therein, you know. Somebody but going all the way back, yeah. I, I would be surprised if someone hasn't hasn't fudged one hasn't created one because you you see people do that all the time anymore oh, sure that yeah. that is an iconic font and now that you say that you did see that on some other games but i totally associate that font with pac-man I right mean, yeah exactly now i don't know who came up with the actual you know the words pac-man in that font but but that was the um you know that, that was the formula that i used to create the rest of the alphabet and that was plenty that that was all the information i needed to create a competent alphabet around it because all, all the strokes were there you had a, you had a rounded character you had straight characters you had an m you're done you're good <laughs> <laughs> i can make, I can make any, any any freaking alphabet out of you can give me that much information you know well that was the thing i understood type and and, and i guess in my head, I kind of thought, doesn't everybody? But but I worked at, you know, a sign company for two years prior to going to Bally Midway. Mm-hmm. Type always seemed to be kind of a secondary thing. And, the, and, and everybody got you know, a lot of chin stroking and the puzzled look like, I don't know, what are we going to use here for the typeface, you know? And type seemed so secondary to me. I, I just felt so at home doing it because... Because I learned, okay, I also learned how to hand letter when I was at the the, um, the sign company. That was back before. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, vinyl letters were invented in 1980. How I know that is because I was working there the day that they came in and went, oh my God, this is the newest, coolest thing ever you've ever seen. Vinyl cut lettering. No more hand painting all the letters on every sign. It revolutionized the business, revolutionized the world, Right. Right. So 19, 1980, that's when, because I, I, re, I remember we were so jazzed to have um, the letters that we, we built our own light box. We, we had a piece of plexiglass and we spent like two days just drilling holes, you know, we crossed it off and drilled holes in it, um, screwed it on, put caulk around it, and then hooked up the shop vac <laughs> and created a vacuum table because <laughs> we were because we were just so damn jazz we wanted to play with these you know the the, the vinyl lettering you know that was right. just like cool it was just the coolest damn thing so sliced bread man what the <laughs> hell so but before that um at, at, at the sign company at the end of the day uh they had all the master craftsmen back there and they would have the journeyman come in or whoever the you know the beginner guys were um and, and they would have hand lettering classes because, you know, they're still teaching that, and, you know, that whole vinyl, had, I mean, it just showed up. Mm-hmm. You know, so they weren't just, weren't just going to throw out the old ways like, oh, look, there's something new. Let's just toss everything out, you know. So, so I was lucky enough to hang out and just kind of poke my nose in at the end of the day. And I hung out there, and, you know, for those classes and I learned how to hand letter. 
but which it turns out is boy, there's a dead, dead craft. It's like it's like going to um, car shows and seeing the guys doing the pinstriping. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're all they're all fifty plus, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, they are. Yeah. Hardly yeah. any. If you see a young guy, it's only because he's an apprentice to this guy over here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it's just one of those dying arts, you know. Like, who's going to do it anymore? If it, I can do it on my computer, why would I want to do it? Yeah, that's that's kind of a thing. Or the the because I've known several people who've worked in the in the like the vinyl appliques or whatever they are for cars, and they just design them and send them somewhere to print out. There's not somebody out there doing that sort of custom touch paint anymore. Right. Or um. Right. Or the certain guitar company that I have on my hat, for example, they might have some guy there and it's like you're saying, it's always an older guy and he'll do that pinstripe on that guitar and magically for that, for those two intersecting pinstripes, uh, the guitar jumps in price, $10,000. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, I'm a musician. <laughs> I play, I play drums. I saw your Gibson hat. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> ah, thank you. Sir. All right. All right, you you you've slept in the back of a van, uh, uh, in, in the back of so, you know that's parked in the alley and some bar, uh, <laughs> yeah. just so so nobody steals the drums and the amps, right? Yes. Yeah. All, all oh the horror God. stories of of Zappa and all and Clapton oh. and all their guitars that got stolen. Yeah. People. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let's let, let's let's do another podcast with that those stories. I, I could, I could <laughs> for, uh, forever. My God! Yeah, yeah, the old, the old days, the old band days. Oh God! You, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade it for the world, though. You know? The, you know, it's one of those things that at the time <laughs> it wasn't so fun, but it comes. You come out of it with the best stories. How about it? Yeah. How about it? And, and, and the weirder the shit happened, you know, <laughs> the better the story. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who believed that they could burn that long? You know, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. and then that's the end, that's the end of the story. That, that's your. That, I don't. You know. <laughs> I saw that you also uh, for a number of years there ran a uh, haunted attraction, Abyss. Oh yes, I did. Yes, I did. How was that? Um, that that was awesome. That was just so awesome fun. I, I, I'm still very very much uh, um, caught up in the, in the whole. Uh, haunted attraction business uh, i make props now for uh haunted attractions and actually i make i make prop i design mm-hmm. i design rides i design like rides for like um uh theme parks and that's, that's what i do now <laughs> yeah yeah i design like big rides you know um a little far uh, i shouldn't say little a farm tractor ride you know that goes to a barn i design the whole damn thing and i um I designed a, a couple of escape rooms. I, I went to Lyon, France, in in uh, 2017 to build one, uh, a, a, a um, an escape room that I had designed. So but yeah, that's kind of what I do now. Is I design props and and you know stuff like that. Um, so anyway, that that kind of came out of uh, Abyss. Um, <clears throat> when you saw what props cost, and I thought. I can make that shit, and, and and not only that, I can do a way better job. In fact, you know, I, I know I could, and, and spend about a one third of what it costs to do it. So that that's pretty much how all that began. Uh-huh. Was uh, you know, I started making my own props, and and uh, before I knew it, it started attracting uh, young artists and theme or, or, or theater people and uh, People that want to learn how to make props and and just ge- generally curious, you know, hangers on that that turned out to be great great you know shop kids whatever uh, learn learn the business and and uh, you know inadvertently we, we ended up putting together uh, quite quite the little scene shop uh, to build our own stuff and then we found ourselves building stuff for other other haunts as well along the way you know so uh, when I got out of the um, uh, the haunted house business. Um, <laughs> That was kind of a weird thing too. About 2012, uh, there was something called the Life Safety Act that uh-huh. was uh, na- nationwide, and um, every state had their own interpretation of it. So Illinois decided that uh, in order to have a uh, uh, an indoor amusement park or a haunted attraction, you had to have a sprinkler system in place. And unfortunately, we were in like a pole barn, a nice one. 
you know, concrete floor. We built, we built a little second floor and everything on it, but it didn't have running water, much less a sprinkler system. A sprinkler system. Yeah. So um, my lowest quote for putting installing a sprinkler system into that building, which was on property I did not own. <laughs> right. $106,000, which was about $5,000 more than the entire building cost. <laughs> so it was game over. And suddenly I had, uh, I was stuck with a quarter million dollars worth of props that were worthless because there were 60% of the other haunted houses, you know, in the state also found themselves in the same boat. Right. So there's a glut of, of you know, props and stuff. You, you couldn't give them away. Literally couldn't give them away. Uh, I remember one one place, they um, they were paying rental fees on their semis sitting in some lot somewhere. They, they were just jammed full of props that they were like, please, someone come with a, with a tractor, hook it up, and just take it. Just steal it. It's yours. Here, the, we, we put the, the title to it inside the door. Just take it. Oh, uh, that's so Get, sad. Uh, yeah, that, you know, so yeah, so that kind of, that was kind of a weird thing. But like I said, it segued for me to go into, you know, the, the prop prop building business. And that's pretty much what I do, what I do now more than, um, I do a lot of stuff. I'm still working in games. I, you know, I, I got a million things going on. I get bored easy. <laughs> <laughs> My, my wife my wife just rolls her eyes and goes, is that what we're calling it <laughs> no i mentally think of this building um this haunted attraction so, a lot of haunted attractions have electrical machinery and you're installing a sprinkler system in a building full of electrical machinery um anyway <laughs> oh yeah, yeah that too yeah uh, yeah mm. so you're going to create a whole nother problem because you either have to waterproof all the props or so there's well another... you know we had to fireproof all the props uh, I, I i remember i had a 55 gallon drum of uh fireproofing material and, and every year we'd fill up a little sprayer and walk around and just hose down any kind of cloth or anything you know because mm -hmm. uh I had some real jag offs for fire fire inspectors out where I was. A bunch, some okay, they were Bible thumpers, mm -hmm. and, and it was they had it in their head that you know if you had a haunted attraction, it's the work of the devil. Oh yep, really? Mm -hmm. Okay, my my props are this plastic and vinyl and you know step here step backstage and I'll show you how it really works. There's nothing. Nobody's worshiping Satan over here, okay? In, in, in fact, I'm 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 on the board of directors at, at, of the Lutheran Church I go to. You can call them up and ask them, okay? <laughs> no, it didn't matter. It didn't. It didn't matter to them. They they had their heads set set on on uh, you know just coming down hard. Uh, yeah. So because of that, um, they would literally. I had this happen. They'd walk through with the scissors and they just cut a chunk of of your prop off. Try to take it outside, try and set it on fire. If it caught on fire, they'd close your ass down. Hey. Yeah, that's what I was dealing with. Oh, God. It's oh, God. Yeah. a loud defacement of property. So that they, oh. oh, yeah, they, they did not care. They did not, and I and I and I truly believe, you know, like, like there'd be like a curtain in a funeral scene or something, literally take a big cut of wedge right out of the damn thing. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> Luckily, it's a haunted house. Like I'll just make the edges ragged. Oh, so what? <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, thanks for helping with the props, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> what you got going right now that um, that our viewers might look forward to? Anything particular? Uh, well, let's see. What what am I doing that that is fun and interesting? Well, like I said, I've, I've been doing a whole lot of uh, premium edition games. Uh, I. Just recently finished uh, um, the artwork, the co uh, cover art on um, Cathedral. Cathedral? Uh, Cathedral, yeah. Uh, and uh, a friend of mine, uh, Nick Huddleston, uh, 
real, very great um, illustrator I met online and just, just uh, he and I got to work on that to, together. We, we didn't know that. Again, it's another one of those, you, you know, uh, you didn't know you're working with somebody until just by accident. He, he posted some stuff on, and I'm like, hey, I'm working on that game too. I saw it on Facebook. You know? <laughs> That's how we found out we were working together. <laughs> the explosion in sort of the, the premium board game format over the last few years is, has really been a thing. You look at companies yeah. like... Um, like cool mini or not charges like a hundred dollars a game and yeah and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It, it's gotten pretty amazing yeah it, it 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 is it's crazy how it's all you know and, and uh nintendo switch is just you know hugely popular so you know that, that that's fun and it's great i'm back in the game business again mm-hmm. not that i will ever really out um you know, just it, it's it, it takes on different different uh, faces. You know? I mean, for for a while there, I was did, doing board games, uh, you know, and I was part owner in the game company. And then even after we sold it, I did board games for a long, long time. Then it kind of segued, and I ended up work, working for PopCap Games for mm-hmm. a while. And I, I, I did uh, cover art for Peggle and uh, Bejeweled Two, and okay. worked on. A, yeah, 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 you know, and, the, and you know those games, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. I mean, it was all very, uh, everything was very, you know, ha- had a high impact and high, uh, uh, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, recognizable quality, you know. Recognizable, ubiquitous. Wow, that's a big yeah. word. Oh, there you go, ubiquitous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they, Doctor, I've got a re- terrible ubiquitous. Let's see <laughs> <laughs> Here, take two of these. Don't call me ever again. Yeah, don't call me ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Until I buy at the store, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, these aren't pills you gave me. It's a plastic cap. Yeah, just take, <laughs> take, take them and get the hell out of my office. <laughs> get the hell out. <laughs> but it, troublemaker. So, so yeah, creativity yeah, so, in those uh, markets now. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, I said there's so much creativity in those markets now. Yeah. Oh, um, crazy. Yeah, crazy, crazy. So, uh, yeah. Um, so that the uh, Jeffrey Wittenhagen. Uh, I met him. Where did I meet him? Some shows. Oh, oh, in, in Phoenix three years ago, at my very first show, and and um, uh, I'm, I got invited back. That's nice. Um, oh my God, I can't remember the name of this show. Damn it, I hate when this happens. Oh my God, I'm of a senior moment. <laughs> <laughs> anyway good phoenix <laughs> it was something good. yeah 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 uh um so now i don't remember where i was going that here's the t- i just here's the trifecta, <laughs> the tri- yeah the trifecta of senior moments <laughs> hey. i don't remember i don't remember a name i can't remember the date and i don't remember where i was going with this story <laughs> <laughs> i i Yes, that's a hat trick, man. <laughs> I fully relate to this. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh well. <laughs> it is what it is. <sighs> it starred Dan Pacino. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, uh, at that show, that show uh, back back in 2019, uh, Dan and I were going to uh, some. A uh, uh, huge party. They were. We were the guests of honor, and it was at uh, some arcade slash bar slash disco slash restaurant. Uh, places jam packed, huge, crazy place. Great fun. Anyway, on the way over in the Uber, he's going. Uh, he goes. Let me give you some uh, celebrity one hundred and one. How to be. How to be a celebrity. What to do. What not to do. You know. And uh, the. One thing he told me that I always remember, I thought, oh, that, that's perfect. It's, it is so, um, like, it just seems such common sense, you know, but I didn't think of it before. He said, be the guy they came to see. Wow, that's, that's genius. Profound. Be Yeah, be the guy they came to see. You know, I've been on the other side of the table plenty. I've gone to lots of shows. I'm a fan. I'm a big fan. I'm a geek. You know, I've spent way more time on that side of the table. So, right. you know, when you, you know, so I think 
when I go to a show, who am I expecting? Who am I expecting to talk to me? You know, it's, uh, and so I want to be that guy, you know, dress the part, you know, not now I, I went I went and had, a, you know, Mortal Kombat, you know, things embroidered on me and I, I look the part, you know, dress, a, you know, I wear yellow shirts and red shirts. My, I'm coordinated with my, my whole, you know, uh, my whole scene, my whole, uh, you know, um, a table and, and everything. Right. And, and you know, I, I, I took it to heart, you know, you dr- dress the part act the part, be the part. You're having a bad day. No, you're not. You're having a great day. <laughs> you're having a great day because these people came to see you. You know, they plan their day around coming to see you. That, that, that strikes me that right, right to my heart. You know that it really does. Um, I, I think maybe uh, going 27 years and not getting credit for the work that I did. Yeah. And being ki- kind of, you know, forgotten about. And then, and I was rediscovered by accident. It wasn't anything I did. So I think that's even better yet that, that it was it, it, like the fame kind of caught up. It found me. It found you. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't do anything to, to, in fact, for a long time, I, I, I didn't even want to accept it. Um, <clears throat> here, okay. Here's how, here's how that all happened. Um, mm. One of my ex uh, haunted house um, cast members who I keep very much in contact with. We call them the minions. And we always said, <laughs> and I was, yeah, I was calling them minions long before, you know, um, the movie came out. Movie, <laughs> yeah, with the minions. Oh, I can't think. Despicable Me. Despicable, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, long before that, I, you know, to, my my minions go back to 2006, okay? So we'd always tell them, once a minion, always a minion. Always a minion. Uh, yeah, so uh, when, when the kids, would, I, I probably... In, in all the years now my show was big it, it, i had chicago is like the hardest um haunted house market in, in the world there are more haunted attractions in the chicagoland area than any other place on the planet so you got to be tough you got to be good and you know oh god yeah i don't know why but boy it, it, it's tough here you can make it here you can make it anywhere so um i my, I, I had about 60 cast members and, and my show was total about 12,000 square feet you know it, no screwing around yeah um yeah you know, okay well that's it i had a quarter million dollars worth of props laying around you know but that didn't just show up <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. so yeah so i, I mean it, was, and it all fit on like three semi you can tell it, it was a huge show you know it's Very big sure. oh, okay so uh, in, in that in that environment boy you got to be you got to be tough Okay, so one of my cast members, um, he's playing the original Mortal Kombat game, and he gets to the end of the game, and he sees my name, and I didn't even know it was on there. Uh, 27 years, did not even know it was on there, and it turns out it's misspelled. <laughs> oh, you'll be here in German. You'll love this. It's N-E-I. N-E-I. Masters. You could have looked at my invoice. <laughs> <laughs> it's spelled there. I'll bet it's right. I'll bet you. <laughs> I mean, oh really. boy! Come on, you can even get to spell my name right on the game. But you know what? They did me a favor because now it's a it's a great story to tell. You know, mm-hmm. like and they miss and they misspelled my name. One last indignity. <laughs> 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 okay, so he calls me up and 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 he, he's like, "Oh my God, Paul, this this is you. You're the Mortal Kombat guy." Oh uh, yeah, you know, I'm like. Oh yeah, I remember that now. <laughs> I mean, really, that was my attitude, kind of like, yeah, I guess I am. I didn't really think about it, you know. And he's going, "Holy shit, I've known you what eight years? I was, you know, nothing. You couldn't even say. Well, so how do you bring that up? How do you? Oh, how about those Cubs? Oh, by the way, I'm the Mortal Kombat guy. Duh, no, that's no, no. So, so you know, all these people that I worked with, none of them knew, and I never said anything, and I thought. You know, back in the day, we, again, we, remember we, they said a, a game was popular until it wasn't. Yeah, and that was our, that was our mentality. So for me, when Mortal Kombat came out and it was popular, and then it wasn't, and and, and as far as in in my mind, I was like, done, I'm done, and I threw my head in the ring to try and get on Mortal Kombat two, and I was told to, and I was shown the door, and and I was threatened with a lawsuit. So oh. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's that's why I disappeared for twenty seven years. Mm. Mm, well, that that and the fact 
that Mortal Kombat ended up in Congress. Okay. And, I, and the entire yeah. rating system came out of that. While that was all going on, my clients were Kellogg's. You know, I was the I, I was the artist for a, a Frosted Flakes for a long time. Rice Krispies mm. I worked on, um, and then M and M Mars. I was I was the Snickers guy for decades, two decades. I was a Snickers illustrator. You know, um, so yeah. If if you've been in a liquor store or a grocery store in the last twenty five years, you've seen my artwork that hand, in North America, hands down. And the last uh, thing you needed was to be associated with something in Congress that was. Thank you. Yeah, you're getting yeah. it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it was a little bit of a, my, um, it was a decision of my, uh, on my own to, to not necessarily, you know, associate myself with it. Uh, and, and that was actually the, the, um, the crux of the lawsuit is they said I could not associate myself with Mortal Kombat for a period of 18 months. And, yeah, and, and I knew that wasn't in the NDA. That was bullshit. And I remember asking, well, why don't you send me that NDA and we'll, we'll, we'll go over it together on the phone. Well, I'm still waiting. That was 29 years ago. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe it'll be showing up anytime soon, right? It's, it's lost in the mail, obviously. Yeah. I know. Well, 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 here's the problem. Um, they didn't think the game was going to be anything. They thought the game was going to be a big crash. Oh, and here's how they knew. They were going to make 300 games. And 300 games is like the, the break even point that for whatever reason, 300 games was the number. That's the least amount of games we're going to make on a production. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's all they had scheduled. So they hired a freelancer moi, to come in and do the final artwork, do the production artwork on, on Mortal Kombat because mm -hmm. they didn't want to tie up any of the staff artists with this game that was going to be a big old stinker. Uh, Oops, it wasn't a stinker. It was a big effing success. And now the guy who doesn't work here is the one that made the most valuable piece of artwork you've ever, ever had. <laughs> and he doesn't even work here. We don't even know how to control him. We should threaten him with a lawsuit. Yeah, let's do that. And it worked. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. Yeah. The, the yeah. Of, of lawyers, yeah. Uh, that's showbiz, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so now fast forward 27 years, and uh, my uh, Josh, my my uh, uh, cast member, sees it online or sees my name at the end of the game, and he, he contacts me and, and he says, Oh my god, this is a huge thing, you have millions of fans. You should meet them. I'm like, you are a knucklehead. I don't believe a word of that. And he said, I'm going to prove you wrong. And he called up Doc Mac. And Doc Mac started sending me texts saying, dude, you're the Mortal Kombat guy. You need to get down here. You have millions of fans. They want to meet you. They want to talk to you. Six months. Six months he petitioned me. You know, so, so that's the, kind of my story is like, not only did I avoid the fame, I, I kind of denied the fame, you know, I didn't right. wanna, uh, don't make me come down there, you know. So after six months, I finally went one day, I'm not talking to my wife about it. She goes, why don't you go down and just see? Who knows? That'd be fun. And she didn't even know. She didn't even know. I had explained to her when all this came about what Mortal Kombat was. She had no yeah. idea or that I was associated with it or anything. We'd been married 20, you know, 23 years and she, she had no idea. And there, there was no reason. I never mentioned it. I forget if it comes up, but you know, <laughs> we'll talk about it. Never did. <laughs> yeah. So well, that and it's just a job to some degree. You know what I mean? And you, it's not like mm. you go home every day and you talk about, you know, you did something awesome at work, but it's still work, right? Yeah. Right, right. right. Well, you know, and just like anybody else, you're focused on what's happening now. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever work I've got here, you know, that I've got after this interview, I've got to get back to to get out. Because, you know, I said I would, you know, send them a text later. And that's how it is. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know? yeah Oops. Basically. Yeah. My wife's working today. That's all we do. You know? So, you know, it, it's a very hands-on, today's the day sort of thing. You don't think about what you did before. You know, mm -hmm. it, with, the, with the exception of saying you're only as good as your last job, which seems to be the 
that, that's kind of the motto of the industry of, of all of any industry really if you think about it you know, you're only as good as your last job well right <laughs> so, um which is one of those things i think I, you know there's a giant market of of nostalgia and all that as as far as that sort of thing goes but no one wants no one wants to stay living in 1982 forever <laughs> <laughs> right right and and i think it was hard for me to um to kind of accept that that was happening um mm -hmm. because you know when you lived it you're like well so what what why is this so interesting but it is interesting people want to you know they want to hear these stories they want to hear me babble on about what happened backstage and you know all a na name drop you know through the whole thing but it's funny because you know, when I think about it, oh my God, I was in the room when it happened. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I've, I've been very, very lucky, very blessed, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, I'm oh, a man of faith. I believe that, you know, uh, God works in your in our lives, you know, somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, brought brought me to that place to do so, something. I, I realize I'm very lucky. I'm, I'm very, very blessed in, the, in that I was in the right place at the right time many, many times. Yeah. I got a lot of friends that are super talented artists. They could have easily done as good a job, maybe better than I did, but they didn't because they didn't have that opportunity. And I did. And I realized that that's a huge thing. That's a big deal. Like, um, are you familiar with um, Graham Ingalls? The artist Graham Ingalls did EC comics in the fifties. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And you know, there, there's, there's a bit of a, you're kind of the happy ending of the story that he never had in a way because the guy you know those comics got basically destroyed by congress and this was a guy who literally was only good at horror comics yeah. and and he disappeared somewhere um i think if i remember the story right he became an out basically an alcoholic he taught like some little art class somewhere and several people that were fans of the books like in the 70s went and found him and he would he would chase people off his property get out of here I, I have no association with that don't want anything to do with him and didn't until you know the very end of his life come to like start to accept that but the thing is is sometimes the rest of the world doesn't catch up for 30 years <laughs> that's the, what you were doing boy no that's so true and and sadly I, um the industry is riddled with stories like that more than not. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, there's always somebody willing to steal your artwork, to steal your, your fame, steal your credits, not give you any credits, not pay you, you mm -hmm. know, leave you destitute. Um, it, it, maybe this sounds a little pompous, but there's a huge envy factor in this business where mm -hmm. people, people who, um, would fancy themselves to be you, but when they're around you or people like like myself or that that talent level, they 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 it it shows that they do not have that talent level. Okay, yeah. and, and it, it, they are exposed to it, and the more they're exposed to it, the more it becomes very very obvious. So the person that they started out admiring and kind of emulating and hero worshiping, they start to um, not, you know, they, they start to have, hold them in contempt. Resent them. You know? Yeah. Yeah. They start to resent, there you go. That they res, it starts with resentment and then it becomes contempt. And, that, and then they, they can become your worst enemy. And, and unfortunately that is what happened with me, with uh, my, my former partner at Eagle games. Mm -hmm. It was like, we, we are, probably the, the we are the biggest enemies now that oh, you, yeah and, and, and at one point in time he, he was the godfather to my youngest oh. yeah so you see how things deteriorate but you know uh yeah and, and it, it was just weird it was just just weird how how everything switched you know we were, we were a great team and then all of a sudden we weren't Ugh. but envy it just killed it it just killed it and I, and and uh there's nothing you can do about it. No. Because you know, you're like, well, I'm going to do the best I can. And that seems to be the thing that's bugging them. You know? Yeah. That's... <laughs> Fuck, that ain't working out at all. You know, I, I, 
I'm not sabotaging my work to make you happy. <laughs> make you, yeah, make you feel better about yourself. Yeah, no, no. Why did you put yourself in that position? You know, and uh, that's another thing too. I can't figure out why, why. You know, who wants to be me? Why do you want to be me? So, oh my God, I've had so many people, you know, try try to get in there or do, you know. It, you don't you want know, to be me. It's a pain. <laughs> right? I, I um. Some Zen book I read years and years ago was like to 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 reach for enlightenment is is a um, great effort. Once you reach it, it's no big thing. <laughs> it just is. And, and you know what? It, yeah, that, that's not wrong. That's not wrong. It, it, it's like watching a Michael Jordan jump shot. Well, that looks easy. No. Oh, no. Oh, he makes it look easy. Makes that's the easy. trick. <laughs> and, yeah. and and once you have that job or that talent or or whatever for you it's not that big a thing um because it's your no. daily thing now you know no. and, and no. Re the relative universe and and so people and their egos are a thing <laughs> oh god how about it oh <laughs> uh, that, that's the biggest killer of, of all but I, I i i was working on a uh, a side project after after i closed my haunted house um i was working on another another haunted house i'm not going to say who it is mm -hmm. um but what, one of the principles there was was just his ego was so huge and he was just useless he, he would sit around at the uh, he'd sit around at the front table and he'd hold court you know and he'd have all these ears and he's telling stories about the old days you know well we're in the back building our asses off you know, he's up in front, you know, stroking his ego, telling stories about the old days. So finally, you know, one, one day I, I took him out in, uh, to the back and I said, here we are in the back parking lot. I want you to take your ego and double tap it at the back of the head right out here. In the, okay. <laughs> take your fucking ego and double tap that bitch and don't come back in here until it's done. Right. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did I go uh, too far? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I did. <laughs> uh, I didn't go far enough. <laughs> I wanted to double tap his ego. <laughs> I was willing to let him do it. <laughs> I'm going to let you do this on your own as a mercy killing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Oh, there's, well, now there's a lovely subject to end our... <laughs> <laughs> Are they talking about killing somebody? <laughs> Don't put it on Facebook because they'll, 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 yeah, yeah. they'll be restricted yeah. the next day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, like uh, oh, there's a there's a great Arnold Schwarzenegger line in uh, True Lies, you know, where she goes, "Did you kill people? Oh, only only bad ones. Only they bad. were just bad. They, yeah. were, they were just they were all bad. They, they were all bad. No, it's, 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 <laughs> yeah." <laughs> Well, you got any uh, other notes you want to tell our viewers today? Anything fun? No, Anything no. we've we've subjected to them long enough. <laughs> we've subjected me to them long enough. I think. No, no, been... no. I'm, 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 I, I've had a great time. Thank you for for uh, bringing me on here. Uh, um, <laughs> just just a lot of fun. We always go more than an hour. I know I'm way out of my time here. You'll edit it down. We'll fix it in the mix, right? That's all gold. <laughs> all gold. Absolutely. There's a mu music term for it. We'll fix it in the mix. Don't worry. Oh, yeah, we'll fix it in the mix. Yeah, I've had several we'll fix it in the mixes. Um, I, had, I had somebody one time who um, wanted me to do a, a video. Because I did some fundraiser videos for, for a couple of local organizations. And um, for Halloween type things. For haunted things. Cool. So that's why I went to the haunted attraction thing. And they would do like a, um, as a fundraiser for like some of the local businesses, they would do a ghost hunters type video when ghost hunters was the big thing. And um, they told somebody before they had gone out and recorded any footage or anything. Oh, we'll, we'll provide you with a, with a half hour video. So, okay. So you got the content for that? No. <laughs> You promised a half hour. Yes. It's like, oh, let me get my magic hat. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> if this were a math equation, there'd be a big section in the middle missing, right? There'd be parentheses <laughs> with like a, a big white out, yeah, thing going yeah. on. Like maybe 27 minutes worth. <laughs> <laughs> you got three solid minutes. Killer, killer, mm -hmm. award winning. Mm hmm. Three, yeah, there was, three. Yeah. There, was, there was five minutes of new footage. So. <laughs> <laughs> pre, said, pre, pre, yeah pre-edited there you go <laughs> yeah. Not, yeah it's raw footage it's not even you know great <laughs> good oh, oh. You're, you're nailing it <laughs> this paul this has been just awesome fun talking with you today <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks. Oh, man, I had a lot of laughs. It was great, man. Um, you know, and, and I, I hope I, I don't. I hope I, I came off positive. You know, like, like like a lot of the business. There's a lot of crap that happened, and I I don't want to come off sounding complainy. Uh, um, I, I'm not. I, I look back at it. It was so much fun, and it was great. Yeah, okay, like before we said, you know, the, the the weirder the shit that happens, the better the story, right? So well, there's also the aspect that when things aren't good, um. It does strengthen your resolve. Yeah. You, do. you know, you either, either, you either fight the fight or you go away, you know? <laughs> so, well, no, you, you know, but you know, um, and here's the thing, and, I, and I, I'm going to bring up Dan Piscina again. He, he's been great help over there. We've had discussions about this before where, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, did shit happen? Oh, yeah. Bad shit. A lot of bad shit happened. Do we want to talk about it and, and uh, bring it up to the uh, fans? probably not a good idea you know let, let's keep it up keep it happy keep it bouncing even if bad stuff happened we just shrug our shoulders and go hey we had a great time let's go out and have a beer you know <laughs> right you know so, and, okay so um perfect example we were at free play florida and we were getting done with a um a mortal combat panel and we walked out and, and i think and like it was simple it was something like we alluded that uh um well, maybe everybody didn't get credit like they should have back when it was, you know, happening. But mm -hmm. you know, it all works out, and here we are, and we're happy now, and uh, yay team, you know. And, and even even with that little snippet, we walked out of there, and in the hallway, Dan leaned over to me and whispered. He said, "We didn't come off negative, did we?" Because it's very important to him, you know that the fans keep a very positive outlook. At, and, I, and I thought to myself, you know, he really cares about what, what the fans think and what they, you know, I do too, I do too. And, and, and uh, I thought that was very poignant of him to, to bring that up. And it also showed uh, a lot of his character. Yeah. You know, that, that, the uh, you know, um, again, be the guy they came to see, you know, that, that, that yeah. comes out of that, you know, be that guy. So I'm hoping that I'm, I'm trying to be that guy as best as I can. <laughs> okay. I, I think you are a very good. You'll edit out, yeah, you'll edit out the parts that don't. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. All right. We're good. There we're you golden, go. baby. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, stopping by and talking with me today. Yeah. Yeah. You know, next, next time I want to play drums. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll bring the Les Paul. We'll have fun. Awesome. Sweet. <laughs> And three three chords yeah yeah no you know what it'll be it'll be uh you know an hour and 45 minutes of of a three chord jam that no <laughs> <ends>. <laughs> we're, we're doing e a and b today revisited <laughs> well, why would you do that <laughs> nobody asked you to revisit it <laughs> <laughs> oh god hey this has been great great fun it really has um yeah. let's do it again well I'll, I'll see you in kansas yep we'll see you in october yeah fantastic absolutely awesome take care and have a great day you too man take care bye-bye bye-bye <laughs>